Hi, everyone. August Vinias here with CPI Capital. I'm joined by Ava Benasaki. Welcome, Ava. Thank you. Thank you, August. And we host CPI Academy YouTube show dedicated to adding value to our viewers' investment journey. We bring on experts and discuss all topics related to real estate investing. Please subscribe, like the video, and we hope you enjoy it. Yes, and we know that you'll enjoy today because we have Glenn Sutherland as a guest. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Oh, well, welcome, Glenn. We're very excited to have you. Uh, the, the reason we are so excited is we're in the space of Canadians investing in the U.S. and uh, long behold, we, we, we met Glenn, obviously, uh, through online, but we realized that not only he has a uh, his focus is in, in, in Canadians investing in U.S. real estate, but also he's created a thought leadership platform where we brings he brings on expert guests and discusses all topics. He's actively involved in investing in the in the U.S. and he's done it brick by brick. So he's yes. built something incredible. So we 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 salute you. We look up to you. You are yes. in a way uh, our, our you know our guru. So we we love to kind of go into it because um, as we've learned on our YouTube show, every time we bring on an a guest bring on a guest on we learn more and be educated ourselves and when looking at your youtube show and how many guests you've had on about this subject of investing in the u.s so you're definitely an expert and an honor to have you on our youtube show yeah thanks so much for coming glenn thank you for having me and, and you, you nailed the head like nailed the hammer on the head or wherever that saying goes but like having interviewing people every single week i you know you get access to people you wouldn't have access to you know you get to ask them personal questions where some of these people, uh, they, they charge a lot of money just to have a 30 minute or hour long consultation. You get to pick whatever you want. <laughs> very true, very true. <laughs> on one of our YouTube shows, we had our Canadian attorney and our US attorney on both securities attorneys and, and yep. we had a, the questions and discussions and they engage each other. So I made a joke that, hey, you know how expensive it is to have lawyers on. <laughs> so it's incredible, you know, both of us, what we do and the experts we bring on uh, oh, yeah. and so on and so forth. Great. Awesome. So Glenn, why can you, we would love for you to, to start off by telling us a bit about your background and how you got started in looking and uh, being focused on U.S. real estate. Sure. Uh, I think it's a lot like the same as everybody. You start in your backyard, uh, you do some investing there. Um, I used to buy duplexes and single families and townhouses and actually not really into condos, but I guess, no, actually technically one of them was a condo. Um, but I was, I was, I was purchasing properties in Cambridge, Ontario, uh, Kitchener, Ontario, uh, right on the border of Waterloo, but not actually technically Waterloo. Uh, so all in through that whole area there. Um, and you know, it was going well, it was doing, getting my, uh, you know, however they worked, I think back then it was like, you know, the 300 or $400 a month in cash flow. Um, and the real story is how I got going down there is, you know, you talk about seven years ago, um, it, it was a lot of the podcasts were American based, at least what I was listening to was American based. And I listened to a lot of American podcasts about real estate. And I learned a lot and I took notes. And a lot of it was like, you get snippets about stuff that would work for Canadians throughout it. And it was like the hardest, longest way to learn the process. <laughs> but <laughs> I, that's how I, I figured out a lot of the, the cross border stuff. Uh, and whenever I got a tenant that was they moved away. Uh, I followed them, bought them a property, amazing tenant. So um, once I was comfortable with a couple hours away for a tenant, I was like, I think I could do this. I think I could go, especially the distance, especially if I was going to hire property management instead of self-managing, which I self-managed everything in Canada, which did teach me a lot, but uh, it, it was real nice to take that off my plate and not spend my weekends fixing toilets and everything else. <laughs> so yeah and that's how i kind of went into the u.s and from there it just sort of started off slow and you know you, you buy some properties and you you pick up your i don't know i think at the time i was picking up about three a year and then uh, you know you start to run out of money and you got to find ways to scale this to to make this grow a little bit faster because sure. you're literally going to run out of money like it doesn't matter if you're the richest person in the world if you just spend it all it's going to disappear yeah, true. Very true, very true. True. and yeah. just, just to take a step back before we get into the, um, the syndication model that i'm sure you're familiar with um so you start out as an active investor here in canada um a, a lot of the information and content the way you're educating yourself is on the information that exists online same with same thing with me and Ava but unfortunately there isn't a, a lot of that information about real estate investing it is it, it doesn't make sense here in Canada that we're in where our U.S. counterparts are are buying real estate and they're cash flowing from day one it's it's very difficult to achieve that here in Canada and, and you noticed 
the potential that exists in the US and you you followed your same kind of process in the US. So talk to us about that. Talk to us about the first deal you got involved with within the US, if you may. Well, I guess <laughs> when I, the way I started wasn't what I would recommend to anybody. So whenever I started down there, I, I, I wanted to take a little bit of a safer route and I did some turnkey properties. Um, and, you know, I still have these properties, but they, you know, they perform slightly better than my Canadian counterparts and they're much cheaper, but the, you know, still getting the three or $400 a month, but they, it, it wasn't, it's not what I would do. And it's not what I learned a lot of my stuff. It wasn't until I started getting into the renovation model and adding value. Cause that's really what you have to do. And it doesn't matter if you're investing in Canada or you're investing in the U S really with your real estate, you need to be adding value with these properties. You need to, to make something, you need to do a renovation. You need to convert a garage into a second bedroom with an ensuite. You need to convert an attic space into another bedroom. You, you need to, we've done back porches and close them in, run the HVAC, run the electrical. You need to make these things better. And especially it's one thing to just like make them nicer and change layouts. But if you can actually add square footage or you can add anything to these, like to like, um, like I was giving examples with like converting garages, um, it, it actually comp out against higher things. If you want to go do a refinance afterwards, or you want to sell these properties, what you're going to compare to is higher, higher amount, higher valued things. Um, and that's what you really want to do. That's, that's the, really the goal. And, and it doesn't have to be like an American thing. You could do this in your own backyard, but you have to, I believe you have to force some appreciation. If you're a flipper, if you're a burr, um, a lot of people call themselves just long-term real estate investors. And you know, that's not really investing. Like I guess it is, but it's, you're not, you're not active. You need to push, put some meat into it. You need to, even if you're not doing the work and you're hiring it out, you need to add value to properties too. Because otherwise, it's like, it doesn't matter if you're buying a single family or you're buying a multifamily unit. Um, if you're going to go into the multifamily stuff, because I think that's what you guys specialize in, is that you're, you need to add value. You need to raise rents, lower operating expenses, add value. And so sometimes you have to, you know, it's just cleaning up units, you can add, increase the rents. Um, and that's always what everyone goes to. But if you can actually decrease operating expenses is really what's going to give you the value. Like I was looking at a property in Toledo that I showed on one of my other shows. And just by raising the rents $40 per unit, we could create $700,000 in uh, based on the cap rate for that neighborhood of value, but just just like that, and and that's really what you need to do. <laughs> you just and you go forty forty dollars a month isn't much at all. Like it's not even you're asking for like a two percent raise. Like it's it's not even a big deal. But it, it's if depending on if you're doing single family or one to four units, or you're doing multifamily, you got to understand what you're comparing out to, like and how the banks are evaluating these properties in order to play their game. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that. No, yeah, you say, force you, appreciation you say, with the natural appreciation. No, for sure. And, and exactly. The game is like, uh, like Glenn said, is the force, it, playing the force appreciation game. A lot of people, especially here in Vancouver and Toronto, here in Canada, a lot of times people buy real estate. They buy their primary resident and they, they're under the impression that they've invested in real estate. Yes, in some way it is, but they're not, they're not active by any means. And that's not an investment. That's a home you purchase for yourself. At times, people buy a secondary home or a second piece of real estate, and it's a long-term play they're there to play the appreciation game to have a nest egg as and sometimes it's called but it's not technically you know it's not really investing in real estate where you're going in you're adding a value you force appreciating it by different creative enhancements i mean look at it this way if you buy a condo and it has a really bad tenant by just replacing that one tenant you've added value there's a lot of different ways to add value oh, yeah. when you talk multifamily. It goes to the it's, it's a cap rate game. So the cap rate is something that's in place. You increase the NOI and increasing the NOI. I mean, just like Glenn said, increasing something, a, a single units rent by $40, it compounds and over time increases your NOI and increase NOI incre uh, equals um, the higher asset uh, value. So, that's and that's a game we play. Um, yep. uh, uh, let us know now, as far as, so you're an active real estate investor, you get involved in the US and and where did the, the thought leadership platform aspect of it come? Your YouTube show, your podcast, uh, your, your speaking engagements, yeah, for example, great. on our show. How did that transition created? And, and tell us about that, if you may, please. Well, I guess the, the first thing was I, I went and bought 
some properties in the United States, and I was part of uh, Kitchener Waterloo KWCREI, which is a meetup group here. And um, you know, shout out to them. And <laughs> I, I was on, and they they wanted me to speak, and I was I I, I was like I, I don't know enough. I don't know. And you know what? Just like putting yourself in those positions to speak and be put in front of the room, it was it was scary off the start. Right now, I just walk up and but you know it's one of those things just to push yourself past it. And they pushed me to no no. This is a hot topic, especially, I think it was like three or four years ago. This is a hot topic. We should, you should talk about it. You're doing it. Let's, let's talk about it. So I went and did it. And um, I'll do lots of name drops on this for you, for sure. <laughs> whether you want them or not. Uh, so uh, I, I, knew, I, I speak with Joe Fairless sometimes, who's a big syndicator down in the United States and Texas. And I think he's in some other states, Florida and stuff now. But um, it was really, I was talking with him and he said to me, he's like, start a podcast. And he's like, you don't know you don't know what it's going to lead to. And I was like, I don't have anything to sell. I don't have, I don't have a product. I'm not doing at that time. I wasn't doing joint ventures. I wasn't raising money. I'm like, I don't have anything to sell. He's like, you start doing it. And then you do it every single week and you do it consistently. And it's going to suck because after a while, there's not going to be enough people listening and you're not going to sure know why you're going to do it. You're not going to have a guest lined up and things are going to get tough. And he's like, it's going to build character. And he's like, and it's going to be whenever it gets really hard, that's when you know you're starting to get somewhere. And then you just keep doing it and you do it and you do it and you keep putting it out every week. And it's like, you don't actually have a boss or anyone telling you to do this, but you get that episode out every single week and you show consistency and people learn that you are going to do what you say you're going to do. And every single Thursday, I'm going to have another show out and you'll start to learn some of the tricks like batching. So now I, I tend to like go on a rampage and I get like a, a month's worth at a time so that I don't have to do it every week um, but or two months at a time sometimes. But yeah, that's what I did. And I just started putting it out and it was, a, it was a sharing. I didn't have a coaching platform at that time. I didn't have anything. And it was just sharing, sharing the experience. And a lot of it at the early days was just me talking. But that is actually twice as exhausting is to try and come up with a topic to talk for 15 minutes was the goal to start. And to talk for 15 minutes, it was going to take me like two hours of prep work of, you know, going through old educational materials and trying to find like something to put out for people that was valuable because I wanted to have a really valuable product. I didn't want just fluff. I didn't want to do that, anything like that. And, and that's what I've been increasingly trying to do every, all the time with this show is, and I get some feedback from people too that help you guide you. But I started doing it with myself and then I'm like, okay, I'm going to get guests. That'll be a little bit easier. And then I got guests and I got lots of local guests who are really good, but I'm like, no, I'm a Canadian investing in the U S I'm going to get Canadians investing in the U S because that's what people are watching the show for. They want people who are doing that exact same thing. Um, and I still have the odd guest that's a Canadian investing in Canadian Canada, but they have to have like be teaching something. I like you need to be telling us, you know, not just I don't want a story from you. I'll give I'll do stories because there's stuff to learn from every story mm -hmm. from like, you know, the cross border stuff. But if you're a Canadian investing in Canada, I'm like, you're going to be teaching a subject. You better let's lay this out because I want value in everyone. And I think that's I don't know if I went on a crazy tangent, but that's how the show grew. And I just started doing it. I didn't have a reason to do it really. There was, especially off the start um, and the equipment has improved a lot over the years. If you go listen to some of the old ones, it's kind of hard on the ears a little bit, uh, at least for me to listen to it. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, I think, that's, I think that's what it is. And eventually you get, become a thought leader and people start coming to you. I never approach anyone asking for money. I never approach anyone asking to be a joint venture on a deal or to do coaching. Seriously, I've never, I have a coaching program that I don't even tell people exists because I don't advertise it. They come to me mm -hmm. and that that's the way you've, I've built it so that I'm not advertising it. I guess I am now. I just said it, but <laughs> <laughs> normally I don't talk about it at all. And I let people come to me to do it because that's it's more authentic and I'm not, I do, I'm not a salesperson. I'm not a salesperson to do any of this stuff. And I think that's what the power of a podcast and a YouTube channel is, is it'll attract people to come to you instead of you chasing them around. Yes. You, I think, 
I got, know. <laughs> I got goosebumps when you started talking there for a second, because you really, you really have to show your internal self, the resilience that you have inside. Yeah. And it really is it really difficult at first to, to get going. So that's really great because now you're able to help a lot of people in doing so. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, and then definitely. you spoke about Joe Fairless. I mean, that's that's someone who takes his own advice. I, I believe he he has or um, he has uh, run a, a, a daily podcast is the longest daily podcast in, 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 in the in, in the world, I believe. Yeah, uh, it's like uh, 4000 or 5000 episodes. It's nuts. I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> but that's resilience for you. And look at him now. He's got this massive um, yeah. following. When he, when he comes up with an apartment building thing, it's funded like in a week or two. Like it's, there's, yeah. there's already people there ready for it. And he's not, not doing little raises. He's doing large raises yes. of money. Yes. Yeah. And talking about funding, now talk to us about your deals. You mentioned about joint venture. Talk about how, how does that work? So let's say there is a deal that comes across your desk that you're interested in. How do you go about joint venturing with, Potentially, I'm, I'm assuming Canadian investors to partner with you. How does that work? How does that look? Uh, please. Well, go. typically, I'm, I'm actually these days I'm more doing the the right raise of private money, and because I what I I was needing the money for such a short period of time. Depending on what kind of project it was, like you get into the multifamilies and it's a longer hold, and yeah, that would make sense to do stuff. And I have done in the past single families and stuff in the joint venture model, but it's increasingly doesn't make sense. Because if you uh, have a good renovation crew that renovates a property in six months and you can refinance and pay everybody out, then you're going, so then you're, you're keeping equity partners in when you only needed them for six months. It, it tends to be, you go, well, I can just pay higher interest rates to, to keep people in, interested in the deals. Um, but the tip, the one I was, was doing, I, I still do them. I, I'll almost say I'm not doing them. There's just a lot less of them. Um, but what, the way it works is I usually raise the money um, for the purchase and the renovation of the properties. Uh, I buy my properties, especially if we're going to talk about like single family or small multis, everything has to be purchased plus reno is 65% of the ARV. And the reason is that is for funding for cash out refis. It, nowadays, I'm starting to get 75% loan to value on a cash out refi, but two years ago, it didn't exist. It, it was 65%. So I had to be at that threshold, but the, the joint venture would put the money in uh, I manage everything. I do the renovations, talk to the contractors, just talk to you know all the different people that are involved in this project managers, insurance, um, the lender. If sometimes if we did a fix and flip loan or something like that, just organize everything together. Um, and then my goal on everyone was to do a, a refinance at around the six month mark, usually pick projects that were about four months long in length uh, and then refinance around the six month mark once we have tenants in place pay out the joint venture um, and and then the, we, we, I would continue uh, splitting everything 50-50 after they got their money back. Um, where was I going with it? There was another part to this. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of how, how we did it. And we, I did it over and over again. Um, I had, I had something else in my head, but I lost it. So. That, that's fine. So, <laughs> so, what, yeah. so you, you have a deal, you create a joint venture on, on this side of the border with your, with your investors. It's looked more as a short term type of loan because that's your, your term, your, your, your cycle is very short. You go in there, you have your crew, you have your system, you are the sponsor, the operator, the, 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 the value add um, project is, is completed. And now you, you refinance, you pay out your investors, but they, they're they still involved in the project. Uh, what, what happens then? Then it would go 50-50 afterwards. So we'd have like an ongoing cash flow for the property and we would split that. Um, so the, the, a lot of it is, so on a cash out refi, if we got more than what the person had in, invested, then we would split that. The, the one I just completed two weeks ago, we split it and then I got a, you know, we both got a substantial amount more because we got a refi at 75% loan to value instead of 65. And plus our appraisal came in better than we'd hoped. So it made for one of those superstar projects. Nice. Um, the one thing that's different from my joint ventures compared to a lot of people that do it in Canada, in Canada, they typically have the um, money partner to be the one who qualifies for the loans as well. I, in, in my cases, we did everything through corporations and 
where the way the corporation would be structured was so that I would qualify for the loans. Because um, a lot of times when you're doing like commercial type financing, um, it's more based on the project and experience. And so I was actually more valuable to the deal than someone without the experience to qualify because it wasn't about debt service ratio. It wasn't about um, your credit score as much. As long as you met, met the minimum requirements, it was, you know, you get into it. Um, it, it, it they do, that does play in, but um, I was more valuable as the qualifier. So it's a little different than a lot of the way people, other people do it. Fair enough. And maybe we can, yeah. we have a few moments to talk about financing, but let, let us dissect this a bit farther because yeah. I feel like, for example, if you compare your investment uh, philosophy compared to ours, ours is much larger. We're raising private equity. Yep. We go through many compliance hurdles that we have to go through. We're raising capital from, from a bunch of investors who are limited partners, but in yep. your case is much more up close and personal. It's much more uh, hands-on where the joint venture partner is uh, uh, has a very close relationship with you I'm, I'm assuming they're getting updates uh, much more frequent than a, a large uh, um, a fund or limited partnership does uh, talk to us about about that process the, the, the way you cultivate a relationship with potential investors and how you nurture those relationships and the, uh, the updates you provide to your investors and obviously at the, at the capital event when it's either refinanced or sold how does that all that work yeah, so with the, for the communication, like uh, it, it all depends on the person. Like certain people want communication a lot and certain people just want paychecks. Um, so depending on what they are, right? And what they, how they feel about the whole thing. Some of them, you, uh, you call them every week and you, you give them an update that, you know, hey, you know, there's some, you know, when you're in a renovation mode, there's lots of updates. And when, when you're in, the just carrying stage afterwards. There's a lot less. There's a lot less things to update on. You're like, yeah, we got the rent this month. And you're like, <laughs> like, you know, like there's a lot less to do. And so the updates get a lot less frequent, uh, even with the ones who are very active. Um, but it, it could be as much as you want them to be. Um, I think the, the main thing is to keep your, your job roles separate. Um, so you, you know what who's in charge of what, uh, if it gets muddy, it gets troublesome, right? So um, in the past, uh, you know, sometimes you like, oh, it would be really, the, the, the joint venture will volunteer to, oh, I, I'm really good with accounting, or I'll do all this stuff. And, you know, that was your role. And it is nice to uh, take the extra help, but it is your role. Like you need, I, I've learned that you don't do that. You, you, <laughs> you, you continue, you do all the stuff that you're going to do and you take keep control of the project. Um, you can be, you can have people who are looking to learn from the, the, the venture and you can hold their hand and tell them every single thing that's going on. And so that they could make it repeatable for themselves as well, but you still need to do everything. You can't, it, it, it's a big mistake to blur roles and let them into it. You really need to keep everything with the the limited partner and general partner situation um because honestly even still who knows if if something did happen and they they slipped on it being active they're the, if there's something a liability thing and they they want to go after the general partner but this limited partner has signed off on some stuff they'll be like what's going on they think that they seem like a general partner as well Right? So it's to protect everyone's interest. That's great advice. Glenn, you mentioned about limited partner, general partner, but you also talked about joint joint venture. There is a significant difference between those two. Are your so, yes, go ahead. So yeah, so there is, there's, depending on how we structure them, we do do them both ways, right? Um, so, and it, a lot of it started from bank requirements. So sometimes they require, because if I'm operating in a limited partnership uh, model of corporation, then they are, depending on the lender, they will require to have a, a GP and an LP set up for the thing, for the, the structure uh, as part of it. So you do have to set those documents up sometimes. Sometimes you can just do it straight as partners, uh, but then you wanna have a partnership agreement drawn up to lay out the responsibilities of everybody and how the whole deal is planned to lay out. Um, and I like to put figures in there and sort of hypotheticals, right? So you want to set goals of how this whole project's going to go. And you want to be realistic with it too, because you don't want to fluff it up and then disappoint people. Because that's, 
that's not what <laughs> that's not what you want to do. It's not how you're going to continue to scale this. <laughs> Absolutely, and, and it all starts with your investor or your partner's avatar. So if if they're someone who's a busy professional, they just want to invest, sit back for you to take care of it, then I'm sure a, a limited partnership would be perfect. Or also in a, in, in a joint venture, there'll be more of a silent partner. But if somebody who wants to learn, obviously through your coaching programs that you're speaking of, uh, this, this would be a great way for them to invest mm -hmm. and learn through the every uh, uh, step of the process. Uh, we have uh, you know, um, people that reach out to us who want to start either the syndication process or investing in the US. And your, um, if you're still taking on investors, it would be a great process for them to not only learn Canadians investing in the US, learning the process, learning about the teams that exist mm -hmm. and you have in the US. So it'd be Every step a, a, of the, the perfect process. Yeah. So anybody watching this would definitely uh, forward them to come and see you. Now let's talk about, um, let's talk about the, this whole fundamental ideas of a uh, uh, fundamental idea of investing in the US. Ava and I, Ava was a real estate agent for 10 years. I was a, a, a developer here in Vancouver. And after uh, 15 years, and, and we both came to a moment that, that we're like, okay, this the opportunities that exist in the U.S., especially when they're syndicated investments, when you can pool a bunch of capital and, and buy these assets and, uh, you know, create the uh, tax benefits that exist for the investors, it was a no-brainer for us. We became believers of it. Talk to us a bit more about opportunities in the U.S. compared to Canada on the multifamily and the single family so our viewers can have a better understanding of why are we so excited about the U.S.? What is it so special about the U.S.? What are these crazy Canadians so focused on the U.S. <laughs> real estate for? Exactly. <laughs> Well, that's the thing too. And like, if you're going to cross the border and do this, you, you want to pick the states that are going to be the most beneficial. And where I'm going with this is you, uh, I like landlord friendly states. Some people are comfortable. They've been for working in some of these provinces that are more tenant friendly, some of the Ontarios or the BCs um, that are a little bit more, the, the judgments go that long, that the um, evictions take a little bit longer. Um, but I figured if I'm going to go to the States, I want to pick something that's going to be less hassle. <laughs> so I'm going to stay out of Chicago. I'm going to stay out of New York proper. Um, like, I won't go into too much of a tangent, but New York State, you ought to know what you're doing because every single municipality has different laws, whereas most states is state laws, whereas New York is county laws for their uh, um, landlord and tenant uh, proceedings. So you got to be know what you're doing there. So um, yeah, there's there's lots of uh, landlord friendly states that you can do evictions in a month or two weeks. Some of the, everything's a little different with COVID right now, but <laughs> before COVID, yeah, you could do this uh, very quickly in a lot of states. Um, Texas is really quick. Um, Indiana, um, Missouri, Florida, Michigan. Anyway, there's lots. Um, I I went into Ohio, uh, Alabama. Uh, in Ohio, you can do them in a month. Um, they're still pretty quick in my standards. Um, but landlord laws, the prices, the prices are phenomenally different. I was looking at like 30 unit buildings and you can pick them up for like 700 grand. <laughs> yes, you can. And, <laughs> and you know, incredible. yeah, and they're, they're, they're out there, right? You just gotta, a lot of these stuff, even still, a lot of these top deals are they could be on the MLS, but a lot of them aren't because the more eyes that see a deal, the more it's going to get pushed up in price. If it's actually something, a lot of times they'll bid it up to back to market or close to it anyway. Um, at least that's what I've found. I know people do amazing things buying off the MLS. 30-year um, loans. Uh, Americans have 30-year loans and people go, why is that important? Well, like, well... <laughs> You're at the mercy of uh, the mar of the the mortgage rates, right? So if you buy in Canada, or, or even you can still get five year loans or seven year loans in the states. But if you're buying these loans, if the if the bottom falls out in either country, because I'm not saying either one is not gonna not kind of high right now. Um, but if either of them were to fall out, you 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 can ride it right through if you have your financing. People need a place to live. Um, and if you have a capital X fund, which is like spare money uh, for roofs and other things, you can ride right through the worst of the storm, right? I wasn't concerned when I, whenever COVID came because I'm like, people need a place to live. I'm like, governments will come up with funding options. A lot, if you're in landlord friendly states, you're just going to get paid. It's just going to be later, right? Um, so as long as you have the money to make it through that, you're, you're going to be good. Um, so landlord laws, prices, long-term loans, 
oh, what am I missing? I usually have a list of five. <laughs> uh, anyway, there's there's a lot of, there's a lots of advantages. The list to, goes on. Yeah, the list goes on. Uh, <laughs> I, I know there's five. I usually have five if I have my like my slides up whenever I do my presentations. Yes. Uh, okay. yes. Um, yeah, that's great. That's why we're so in love with being Canadians, investing in the U.S. Absolutely, and, absolutely. And the list yeah. goes on. Um, Glenn, before we let you go here, really quickly, uh, what would be your number one advice that you'd give to a passive investor looking to passively invest in real estate? Um, uh, do your homework, I guess. Um, know who you're investing in, right? Um, there is a lot of people that do really great things. And there's a couple that spoil it for other people. Just don't get hooked up with the couple that spoil it. Um, do, do your research with some people, uh, you know, get, feel comfortable, like uh, referrals are the best. Talking to other people who have done it are the best. Um, you know, I, I think it's about a, if you're being passive, it's it's really just to make sure that you're it's gonna go the way it is and what's the um intent of the operator if things aren't going to go perfect what is the plan is it capital preservation is it to um how are, what are their plans for things that don't go bad and if they don't have any plan for that the worst case scenario um it might be a red flag uh, i know like you guys being syndicators you're going to have that private placement memorandum and a lot of documents they're going to lay out a lot of the worst things um I know when I look at them, they're terrifying, but it is, it, it sets the tone. Um, and if it, the most of those aren't scenarios that are going to happen, but people are prepared for them. Right. And, and that's, that's really the thing. I think it's just to know who you know, here you're investing with a little bit. And that's one of the things with having a podcast, people get to know you and they'll understand what your intentions are just by the way you ask questions and the way you talk. Great, Great advice. advice. Great advice, Glenn. Uh, we will share all your contact information and the way people can, can reach out to you. If you'd like to briefly say it on the video, say it now, but it will be all. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, Please below. let people know how they can get in, in contact with you. Sure. Well, if you want to find me, the easiest way is Canadian investing in the US or Glenn Sutherland. You just, just Google it. Uh, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, Google Play, and YouTube. <laughs> amazing okay, amazing awesome. glenn thank you so much we can't wait to have you on again oh, uh, thanks you're a superstar <laughs> and we we appreciate your time today thank you oh, thank you guys <laughs>